Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church and School where we worship the Lord Jesus. Today is a very special day in the life of the church uh, because today is Pentecost where we uh, commemorate and celebrate the outpouring of the Spirit uh, there in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and that continual work of the Spirit continuing to make uh, the work of Jesus known and drawing all people back to uh, God's throne of grace. And so glad that you're here with us today. If you're new or a guest with us, my name is Pastor Noah Kegley. Welcome to everybody who might be tuning in online. So glad that you're here today. I uh, also want to say a special thank you to all the musicians, uh, handbells, choir, organist, uh, people up there with their horns. Thank you for blessing us uh, in God's house with your uh, musical gifts this morning. And so we recognize that God is with us here in this place, so I'm going to ask you all to please stand and go ahead and greet the people around you with the love of Jesus. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, O Day Full of Grace.
of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this is he, now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Upon this, your confession, I, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing our next song.
and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, on this day you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day, by the same Spirit, to have a right understanding in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord.
The epistle is from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. <clears throat> and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. In anticipation of the gospel, please stand. Alleluia! Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia! The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th and 16th chapters. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, Creator Spirit by Whose Aid.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. From our Old Testament reading from Ezekiel chapter 37. Then he, God, said to me, Ezekiel, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem us, to rescue us, and now has poured out his Spirit upon us. We thank you that we have received the Spirit and help us, by the power of your Spirit, to share this word with the world. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's an anticipatory thing in most households when people can set out decorations for particular holidays. You know, when it comes to Christmas, most people are pretty pumped up to get the tree out, hang the lights, pull out the nutcrackers, and get into the Christmas spirit. Easter, you pull out all the pastels, the eggs, the bunnies, the carrots, whatever it might be. But for a day like today, Pentecost is a little bit more challenging. And so we come here today and we pull out the red. We've got geraniums. They're great. They're beautiful. Thank you to everybody who donated those. And it's red day in the church. But you would think I'm a little bit weird if I said a good way to celebrate Pentecost would be to pull out your Thanksgiving decorations. And you think, that's weird. Pastor Noah, it's springtime here in Illinois, and things are in bloom. Colors are brightening up. The world is lush and green. Why in the world would you pull out your Thanksgiving decorations? Well, at Thanksgiving, we recognize that it's the end of the growing season, and now it's the harvest time. But if we want to properly celebrate Pentecost... We ought to celebrate the harvest. And you think to yourself, what? Well, in Jerusalem, which is not Illinois, it is actually the barley harvest. And so when God called his people to celebrate Pentecost, what they did is they brought the the, Pentecost uh, is originally the Feast of First Fruits. There were three feasts that God called his people to come to the city of Jerusalem and to offer sacrifices and their offerings in the temple. And Shavuot is the Feast of Weeks, where God's people were called to bring the first fruits of their harvest and lay them before the Lord, bring them to the priest. And in the land of Israel, Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, celebrates the barley harvest. And this is fitting for Pentecost because Pentecost is God bringing in a harvest, not just of grain but of people. What we see in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago is that God is bringing back his people that were once scattered. The Tower of Babel that sent people all across the world confused their language. People are now being united by the blood of Jesus and the outpouring of the Spirit. And what the Spirit is doing is he is drawing all people to the cross and to the empty tomb of Jesus. So if you want, go home and pull out some of those uh, fake corn stalks that are up in your attic and know that you have been harvested. God has drawn you to himself. And what's interesting about Pentecost is so oftentimes we can look at things in Scripture, in God's story, and think that was then and this is now. That Pentecost, that was a big deal all the way back then. But the truth is, Pentecost is still going. Pentecost has not stopped. Because God, by the power of his spirit, is continuing to draw people to the work of Jesus, uniting them 
into one family, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And here we are. Today, we are recipients of Pentecost. Because think about it. At the Tower of Babel, God confused the language of all the people, sent them across the globe. And as a result of the diaspora, the the Assyrians coming and scattering God's people, Babylon coming in and scattering God's people, now at Pentecost, God chooses to act at big times and in big moments. Where you've got all these people, Parthians, Medes, people from all over Mesopotamia, now in the city of Jerusalem, it is now that God chooses to have Peter open up his mouth And people come to faith in Christ. And those people who are scattered after they go back home after Pentecost, they share this message in their homeland, person to person, generation to generation. And the Spirit did His work. And this required people to be a little bit risky, to transcend cultures, to transcend comfortable lives. And God's people continue to share this message, and here we are now, 2,000 years later, in the year 2024 in Batavia, Illinois, celebrating the fact that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have been connected to Jesus for this life and the life of the world to come. But the question now becomes, what does Pentecost have to do with Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones? And I'd like to offer that what unites these texts is the work of the Spirit and what the Spirit does. Allow me to explain. A question that I frequently get from the young people of the kingdom of God is, hey, pastor, are there zombies in the Bible? And I say no, but Ezekiel chapter 37 is probably about as close as we get to zombies. And what we learn in Ezekiel 37 and in Acts chapter 2 is that what God does is he takes the the living dead and he revives them. He makes them alive. God takes dead things and he brings them to life. That's what God does. That's what God did at Pentecost and that's what God does in the Valley of Dry Bones. But a little bit about Ezekiel. Who is he? What's he doing? Ezekiel is a prophet that has a little bit different story than some of the other prophets. Because God's people, they were exiled into Babylon in three different deportations. And Ezekiel was a prophet that was deported in 597 BC. And the reason he was deported earlier is because he was smart. He had skills. And so Ezekiel's life prior to being a prophet was actually a priest. Prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel stood in the temple serving God in that capacity. But as Ezekiel is in exile, he's standing along the Kabar Canal, and as he's in exile with God's people, God appears to him in this magnificent, awesome, and terrifying vision. And God calls him to be a prophet. And one of the ways in which God communicates to Ezekiel is he calls him son of man, And this is representative that Ezekiel is supposed to go speak to God's people, that he is a descendant of the one man, Adam. And now it is Ezekiel's job in exile to communicate God's truth to his people. And so Ezekiel is transported in chapter 37 to a valley of dry bones. There's no life, and he asks the question, can these bones live? Or God asks Ezekiel a question, can these bones live? And he says, oh Lord God, you know. And God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and speak to them. And when he does, breath will come into them, sinew upon sinew, flesh will come upon them, and they will live again. And this experience that Ezekiel gets is representative of the fact that God's people are no longer living in Jerusalem. They have been exiled. And these bones are representative of the status of God's people. They are clean cut off. Their hope is lost. God's people are technically alive, but they're kind of the walking dead. They're sort of like zombies. They're cut off. Their relationship with God too often has been nonchalant, and here they are in exile. God's people were exiled as a result of idolatry, nonchalance, the meh, 
who cares sort of mentality. And God taught his people a lesson. He sent them into exile. And the way in which I think this is practical for us is so oftentimes we ourselves can just be go-through-the-motions kind of people. Not really know the why or the heart and soul of what it is that we believe. We can just kind of show up, go through the motions, meh. Another day, another church service, another lesson, so what? And this is a problem. And so when God's people fall into that trap, they brought in idols. They worshipped the other gods of the nations around them, and God taught them a lesson. And I think we ourselves, we can get caught into this trap as the people of God living today. We can kind of become the walking dead. But you know, this doesn't just happen on a personal level. This can also happen on a congregational level. And you think to yourself, how can that be? Well, when congregations spend more time thinking about things outside of the gospel, outside of the word, and more time, more energy, more resources are poured into things outside of the gospel, outside of mission, outside of evangelization, we can kind of fall into this trap. If congregations are spending more time talking about the color of the carpet rather than how are we going to share this message with the world, you might have become a congregation that's part of the living dead so to speak. And so what congregations need to be about, what we need to be about, is we have to be people of the Word. We have to be people of prayer. We have to be people of witness and have our lives conform to God's truth. Spend time in that, to be formed and to be shaped by that. But another way in which people can just be kind of cut off or feel like their hope is lost is things happen to us in life, right? The death of a loved one, Hardship, challenge, the things in life that weigh us down. And so the good news for us today is that we are not the living dead. We have the Spirit. We are recipients of Pentecost. We have been connected to the work of Christ for all eternity. Whether you were a baby or whether you were an adult, you received the gift of the Spirit in your baptism. You are connected to the work of Jesus for eternity, this life now and in the life of the world to come. We are not in exile as the people of God were thousands of years ago. We have his spirit. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. The spirit lives inside of you. And guess what? The spirit continues to form you and shape you day by day, week after week, month by month, trial after trial, that in all those things, God is still at work in your life. And because the spirit dwells inside of you, it means that your sins are forgiven. You are not cut off from God. You have been brought into his presence. You have received the the promise of everlasting life forever. And so my encouragement, my challenge for all of us today is to have a different kind of posture, to have an open posture asking for the Spirit to continue to form us and shape us. And there's a fancy church term, and I'm not trying to be fancy, but uh, there's a specific term when we ask for the Spirit to form us and shape us, and that term is epiclesis. And it's a specific prayer where we ask the Holy Spirit to form us, to shape us, to make us more like Jesus day by day. And the best part is, you have the Spirit. He dwells inside of you. You have been forgiven. You have been washed clean. And the work of Pentecost is going to continue. It's not a one-time event. It's not a one-off. That was then, this is now. The work of the Spirit is going to continue because God is going to use his baptized people, which is you, to share this message. So it's my hope and my prayer that you would continue to live this message This past week, I came across an article that was uh, really eye-opening for me, and it was written by uh, by a guy by the name of Jake Metter, and he gives a stat that is kind of alarming and sort of uh, downcast, but he says that over the last 25 years, over 40 million people, over 40 million Americans have stopped going to church. And the reason, he says, isn't because of something, uh, you know, big or extravagant that can happen, but the reason most people have stopped going to church is the slow fade. 
It's just the way in which we as Americans live our lives, the busy, the hustle and bustle, the pursuit of success, the pursuit of money, the pursuit of prestige, that pretty soon everybody's working 60 to 70 hour weeks that the only day of rest you get is on Sunday. And so for us as the people of God, our challenge is to find those people that have been part of that slow fade and to do exactly what Peter did, to open up our mouths, to talk. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be out, you know, in the public square standing in front of thousands of people. But it could be over coffee, breakfast, cutting the grass, spending time out on your back patio on a gorgeous day like today. And in those moments, because you have the Spirit, the Spirit will work where His Word is shared, when you open up your mouth. And you can do this because you yourself have the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you all to please stand as we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We come together in a time of prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For an abundance of the fruits of the earth and for a plentiful harvest, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, the suffering, and the dying, especially for the people in our own Emmanuel community, those who are homebound, those who battle disease, those who feel as though their hope is lost, and for the people who are grieving, especially for the family and friends of Rogers Brockman who entered rest, comfort his family and friends with the promises of the gospel and all those people that we name silently in our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For an increase of the Spirit and the work of witness, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For pastors, teachers, missionaries, church workers, and especially for all the work that takes place in our school here at Emmanuel, and all who proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For, the unity in, for unity in the congregations and for the unity of the church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a spirit of repentance and renewal, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for a spirit of reconciliation and peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In thanksgiving for those who have gone before and for our faithfulness unto death, that we may receive the crown of everlasting life, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
we respond to God's graciousness and his generosity as the people of God with our worship and praise, tithes and offerings, and so we pray these words together. Eternal God, giver of all good gifts, you have blessed us in our life together. We thank you for providing our daily bread. Continue to give us unity of mind, pure intentions, and courage to extend your church for the salvation of the world. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for these gifts. We pray that we would use them faithfully for the mission of your gospel. Amen. up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, who of your goodness brought life to all that is, and in your mercy redeemed your lost creation through the power of your Son's obedient suffering and life-giving death. Work in us by your Spirit that we may be restored to you and guided to the fulfillment of your saving purpose in the world. Bring to our remembrance your word that we may confess the good news of our accomplished salvation to all the world. Grant us your grace and favor that we may approach your altar with repentance and faith, that no sin may prove harmful to us, and we may be fed and nourished to everlasting life in this blessed communion. As our Lord has taught us, and in fulfillment of his own testament, grant that this bread feed us upon his holy flesh, and this cup give us his precious blood to drink. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, Jesus took the cup when he had finished supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Lord, hear us as we pray and as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now may this holy body and precious blood strengthen you and preserve you in faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We stand as we sing. Almighty God, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that he may rule and direct us according to your will. Comfort us in all our temptations and afflictions. Defend us from all error, and lead us into all truth, that we, being steadfast in faith, may increase in all good works, and in the end obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing our final hymn, Holy Spirit Ever Dwelling. seated. Thank you so much for joining us here in God's house today. If you were a guest or visitor with us, thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you have a wonderful week in Jesus. Uh, each week we email or we give out a physical copy of news and notes to show everything taking place in our community. Uh, go ahead and grab one, but if you, um, well, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things there. That uh, Emmanuel family at Wall Camp taking place June 7th through 9th, so go ahead and mark your calendars for that. And likewise, VBS registration is now open. Uh, we need young people to actually attend VBS, but we also need volunteers. And so uh, go ahead and take a look at that QR code, go online, call the church office. Uh, we would love to, uh, to have as many people part of that effort as possible. And remember, it's not coercion if it's in service of the gospel. I'm just kidding. Oh, well, but kind of not, but you get what I mean. Um, 
and so put that on your calendar. It's going to be a fun week here at Emanuel. Um, likewise, uh, we're revamping our building and grounds uh, committee and also a hospitality team. So if you've got questions about that, take a look at that in news and notes. But enjoy this absolutely gorgeous day that God has given us. And just know that you belong to God because the Spirit dwells inside of you. So go in peace as you serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks.